Good evening. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much for this kind of introduction. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure uh, to be here and uh, it's also an honor to be here. We are currently traveling with our students through Japan, uh, looking at uh, Kenzo Tange's uh, work and uh, we all are very much impressed uh, by um, this travel and by the work I uh, see. But today the topic is another one. I would like to speak this night about Swiss architecture or somehow to trace a short history of the last 40 years of Swiss architecture. But what might Swiss architecture be a priori? Can architecture convey a national identity? Is Swiss architecture like of the Swiss products, Swiss on account of the material used or because it unveils certain specific characteristics. Swiss architecture might of course mean architecture either that was built by a Swiss or is located in Switzerland. But then how might we define buildings constructed by the Swiss abroad? Are they Swiss? And does a building built in Switzerland by a foreigner automatically become Swiss? Or better still, might we perhaps choose whether a building is Swiss or not, depending on the quality? These questions, of course, apply to any nation, yet the case of Switzerland seems to be a particularly thorny. Indeed, a great number of people have dismissed the idea that Swiss architecture has an identity of its own. John Ruskin did so as early as 1837. The British reformer opined, moreover, that there was no uniform climate in Switzerland, but rather a blend of different climates ranging from that of Italy in the south to that of the North Pole in the, in the north, so that Swiss people could therefore not develop a character of their own and consequently, so Ruskin's conclusion, no link could possibly exist between architecture and the Swiss character, since there was not such things as the latter, a specific Swiss character. Likewise, the American Kidder Smith, renowned for his series of photograph surveys of contemporary architecture in various countries, in Italy, Sweden, and Brazil, for example, began to survey of Swiss architecture he published in 1950 by noting that the main feature of the country was its lack of unity. He put this down to the regional organization of its political structure, its three different languages, and the varied topography of its plains and Alps. The whole variety of the American topography was in Switzerland following Kino Smith, and it shows it in a little drawing, condensed to a surface as large as North Carolina. This perception of Switzerland are not exclusive to foreigners, however. Whether right, rightly or wrongly, they have become deeply ingrained also in the country's self-image. Thus, even in the late 1990s, engineer Jörg Gonset justified the use of different materials, timber and stone, for his two bridges on the Via Mala, a, a narrow valley which has, which has connected German-speaking and Italian-speaking Switzerland for many centuries in terms of these two different cultures. On the one side, Gonset explicitly referred to the use of timber in the north and of local stone in the south, and therefore used somehow the stone, a construction for the bridge on the Italian side and the uh, wood construction on the German side. To speak on Swiss architecture thus is to establish a framework, be it national, as in the case of the political endeavor of the 19th century, picturesque, as in the case of John Ruskin, bound to the material as in the two bridges of Gonset, or be it methodological, as in the reading I would like to propose today, and which finds its expression in the notion of autonomy, which was claimed for the first time in the 1970s, and which would 
highly influenced contemporary architectural thought in Switzerland. The roots of contemporary architecture on this the older and younger generation agree can, as a rule, be traced back to Aldo Rossi. Aldo Rossi influence in the southern part of Switzerland, also more on the Swiss, so-called Swiss tendency of the 1970s, as well as his two period of residence at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, ETH, in Zurich in the 1970s, have often been described as a watershed, a change between one period to the other. His central importance to the architectural discourse is easy to demonstrate, be it merely because of the significance his thesis on the autonomy of the discipline continues to enjoy in Switzerland to this day. It can be best explained by the apparition architecture for the museums, and this is also the title of the lecture today, that Rossi had coined in reference to Paul Cezanne's comment that, the only paint, that he only painted for museums. What architecture for the museums postulated as a starting point was the imperative that architecture, in analogy to painting, had to follow a rigorous logical development. For painting, the instance where this could be verified was the museum. Just as, according to Rossi, a picture submitted itself to the logic of painting in the museum, so the implicit inference is that every building had to comply with the logic of architecture. Beyond the critique of the usurpation of architecture by other professional sectors, such as the building trades and economy, but also sociology, the call for autonomy was precisely in Switzerland formulated first and foremost as a claim to an understanding of architecture as the art of construction governed by its own rules. What Aldo Rossi tries to do here somehow is to postulate that architecture, of course, is dependent on sociology, of course, it's dependent on, on economy, but it, that it has also its own rules, and somehow that the architect has to master them and has to show himself through the rules of architecture, and he's not somebody uh, committed um, to other uh, disciplines or dependent somehow. This position launched a distinct Swiss movement but also defines the fundamentals for a highly developed aesthetic discourse that have continued to have an authoritative influence on Swiss architectural accomplishments into the present. Hardly any other competition, and here we see it as a place of the competition of the Lake of Geneva, any, hardly any other competition better exemplifies the state of architecture in Switzerland at the beginning of the 1970s than, the, than the, new, the competition for the new campus of the Swiss Institute of Technology in Lausanne in the year 1970. It's not the ETH, but it's uh, the correspondent university in the south part um, uh, and French-speaking part of, of Switzerland. As a matter of fact, the Swiss government invited seven firms representing the seven greater regions of Switzerland, from Geneva to Zurich and from Basel to Ticino to take part. The design approach pursued by the seven firms was surprisingly similar, from the grid planning from the team of Geneva, the apparently sheer, unendingly expandable structure of the Basel team, which you can see here, which can go up in Develop itself in the north to the south to the west and to the east, to the grid formed master plan from the Zurich team, or the matrix of the team of Soler, which you can see here uh, on the uh, right side, uh, where somehow every field can be, uh, um, can be constructed depending on the needs of the, uh, of the university. What unified this? so-called megastructural projects was a conception of the university as a center of production. A center for the production of knowledge, which thanks to its flexible and evolutionary structure would be able to adapt to changing needs just like any other industrial plant. 
the Ticino group uh, entry with uh, Mario Botta, which is not sit Aurelio Galpetti and others whom you per perhaps uh, know, the Ticino group's entry whose genealogy could be followed back to projects like Le Corbusier's the Nice Hospital, uh, Louis Kahn's proposal for the center of Philadelphia, or Candilis, Josic, and Wood's uh, university building in Berlin, might conceivably, given its horizontal expanse and evolutionary aspect and superimposed circulation system, be ranked uh, with them as an example of megastructural. Indeed, indeed, if you look at the uh, plan of uh, the Ticino team, you see somehow that the idea of an extendable, extendable structure is uh, also uh, visible in the, in, this, in the scheme as it is, for instance, in the uh, university scheme in Berlin. Such historical references, which have shown the Venice Hospital, we can't, Philadelphia scheme or the university in Berlin, the, such historical reference allows the Lausanne proposal to be read in the light of a precise architectural tradition. Yet, they do not explain the ways in which the Ticino group set a new architectural benchmark, one that was to catapult its member, as I said, Mario Botta, Aurelio Gaffetti, which is not the others, onto the national and international architectural scene of the 1970s. What became apparent in this scheme with a clarity unique in that period was an epistemological shift in the design approach, which was to fundamentally redefine architectural production in Switzerland in the following years. The concept of architecture illustrated by the majority of the project as an adaptable, extensive, and transformable environment was to seed eventually to a concept of architecture, whether in relation to the isolated object or to the city, as a formal <coughs> problem. From that point on, the physical reality of either a selected territory or a city would be taken as a point of the departure of <coughs> any analysis and as the concept against which any intervention should be evaluated. Indeed, the grid of the Ticino group draws not on a pragmatic approach, but on a spatial one, for its square shape is derived not solely from an organizational problem, but from a formal intent. Its dimensions are, long, are no longer explained as an outcome of a pragmatic constraint, as a response to territorial problems. You see it quite well in this, in this uh, <coughs> scheme here, that the border somehow of the project are defined from the beginning. In the other project, somehow you had a nucleus, and this nucleus could expand. Here you have exactly the contrary. You have a very strong uh, external frame, which is here, and which can be somehow extended towards the center uh, if necessary. So you have clear external uh, boundaries which defines the, the building and these clear boundaries are, are somehow in, in, in relation to the territory, in opposition in this case uh, to the territory. The Ticino project obviously owed a great deal to the Italian Tendenza and its discourse to Andorossi and others and it furnished the proof that the theoretical model which were developed in the 60s by persons like Aldo Rossi or, uh, or Gregotti um, or, uh, in, in Italy uh, would also be, or would work also successfully in uh, the Swiss uh, territory. Nonetheless, <coughs> as proposals for the restoration of the Castel Grande, the castle in Bellinzona, exemplify only too well, the way these theoretical models, the model coming from Italy, were to be interpreted was to prove controversial. In 1974, Bruno Reichlin and, Bruno and Fabio Reinhardt, then assistants of Aldo Rossi at the EPH, devised a concept for the restoration of the castle, um, a medieval castle, which had been extended throughout the year till the 19th century. Uh, in Bellinzona. It proposed a dual strategy. Firstly, to expose the original parts of the building, and secondly, 
to build a modern concrete and steel structure uh, above it and thus facilitate visits to the archaeological site. And you can see here in this drawing, you see somehow the different layers which are given uh, by uh, stone layers but also by old uh, pictures. And above it, uh, in a very abstract manner, you have this steel bridge and some concrete uh, element in, in it. The first step corresponds to the methods applied in the same period by archaeologists. It is to expose any layers concealing the original structure. For just as it is necessary to remove the earth that covers remains in order to understand them, so too it would be necessary to clear the eclectic and historicist additions to the castle in order to allow its original structure and any architectural remains to reemerge. The new structure proposed in the second step, a concrete porticos and an observation deck in ironwork, which you can see here, were designed to add a contemporary layer in striking contrast to the castle's original features. In this proposal, the architect sought to highlight, through a structural reading of the castle, the different strata in the history of the site, and thereby embed the intervention in an ongoing historical narrative. So somehow you can see the narrative from the old structure up to the newest one, uh, which is the steel and concrete structure in so-called contemporary uh, material. This reading of the Castel Grande, this is the site we just have seen uh, before, um, the reading of the Castel Grande as an architect Archaeological Museum stood in marked contrast to the proposal made by Aurelio Galfetti, who took over the project 1981 in the wake of some political controversy. Instead of exposing the castle remains, Galfetti simply cleared the hilltop of vegetation in order to emphasize its stone created by glacier in the Neolithic era. What he does somehow is this, this mountains were full of trees here. This, this, uh, this, uh, this um, stones uh, were full of trees. And so he cut and cleared uh, the trees uh, from uh, this, um, from this uh, mountain. Instead of Reichli and Reinhardt historic promenade over archaeological remains, he designed a panoramic a panoramic walkway that links the town's main square to the foot of the Rocky Mountains to the castle courtyard via an elevator, which you can see there from the uh, central plaza of Benizona. You can take an elevator, which brings you up uh, to the castle, and on the hill you will have this uh, square, uh, and then from there you, you could walk down um, and, and go over uh, the valley uh, by walking on the, on the castles, uh, the old walls, which are uh, here. So it's not, his goal is somehow not to expose the history of the site, but somehow to transform the meaning of the site by um, reprogramming what one could say as the different eras uh, which were uh, already uh, there. Hence, the castle was set to become not an archaeological site relating Swiss history by exposing and reconstituting its signifiers, but a site of entertainment. So it's really a change also of program. It's not anymore the history which is important. What is important here is the way people would engage with this historical site. It no longer stood in relation to traces of a reconstituted past, but in direct relation to the territory. So here what is important somehow is that the geometry and the morphology of the stone is set in direct relation to the mountains uh, which are uh, around. It's a quite a, a, a narrow uh, valley. In the middle of the valley you have this, this stone, uh, uh, this, this stone uh, mountain, and so it's set in relation uh, to the other ones. The shift from the first to the second project is of importance in two respects. On the one hand, it marks a transition from an historical or archaeological approach to a spatial one. 
and on the other from a historical reading of the site to its interpretation in formal and material terms. It's not on the base, it's on the basis of this dual shift from history to space, from sign to material, that the architecture of the 1980s in Switzerland was to emancipate itself definitively from that of its Italian tendenza precursors, um, like the one I just mentioned. A similar shift was to be taken some years later in German-speaking Switzerland. It was to be precisely described by architect Marcel Meile in his survey of contemporary architecture with the title A Few Buildings, A Lot of Plans. <coughs> you will see that the title is quite uh, important from 1989. So after 10 years somehow, of uh, uh, he, he looks back uh, to the Swiss architecture. Miley quote a common viewpoint of the day in that is ascribed the reorientation in architecture to the influence of Aldo Rossi who had taught, as I said, at the ETH in the 1970s, where Jacques Herzo, Pierre Demeron, and others, like Miley or Miroslav Schick, um, numbered among his students. So it was a highly influential moment when Aldo Rossi came for two times, in the 72 to 74, and then again in 75 and 76, and he somehow uh, extremely influenced the younger generation that would become so uh, well known uh, all over uh, the world. Miley's description of the enthusiasm provoked by Rossi's architectural approach was accurate. Yet he also emphatically pinpoints the difficulties inherent to transporting, transposing the Italian, the foreign influence into the specific Swiss situation. According to Miley, this is why from the outset Rossi students sought the identity less in the local legacy of building types and also more pointedly in the everyday rituals of contemporary modes of living in Switzerland. This confrontation with Swiss reality, the non-urban character of the cities, the face that modernity of the service economy and its commonplace rationality allowed them to emancipate themselves from the historical pathos of, the, of um, Rossi's rationalism that you can see here in this uh, sketch of Aldo Rossi. It's a combination of very pure uh, elements and which relates directly somehow to some historical feature like the column or the, 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 the simple uh, volume and uh, next to it the sketch or a sketch by Marcel Meile and Jonathan Schick uh, for a, a competition where you see that they are much more interested in the everyday uh, reality. Meile logically concluded his excursus on Rossi with the remark that the young architects were better able to deal with the term ambiente in Rossi's teaching, which means atmosphere, um, than they were with the term tipo, typology, probably you have heard this from Aldo Rossi's and Aldo Rossi's teaching, where the, the notion of typology and the historical interpretation and origin somehow of every type is so important for, for his teaching. But somehow, what do you do when you have no uh, great history like the Italians have, so somehow you have to transform and adapt your teaching to the specific uh, space. With the exception of Rossi's closest collaborators, uh, Bruno Reichlin and Fabio Reinhardt, for instance, who were to pursue the Russian thesis and to add a linguistic dimension <coughs> to them in certain major projects like the Catatonini, the Ticino, which is a reinterpretation of uh, Palladio's uh, Villa Rotonda, uh, as you see, it's a central plan with a, with a court uh, in, in the middle. Uh, so it's actualization somehow with new materials, with a new program of a very old Italian uh, type, with the exception of Rossi's closest collaborators like Bruno Reichlin and Fabio Reinhardt, or Max Bosshardt, uh, Eduard Imhoff, Christoph Luxinger, and Karl Lustenberg which you can see, who some 10 years later were to borrow 
several Russian motifs and elements such as the axis gallery, the vertical order, or the volumetry of the Galera Tese for the competition entry in 1981. Besides <coughs> this student of Aldo Rossi, the architecture of the late 1980s did ultimately come to define itself around the notion of ambiente, or as I said, atmosphere. There is no attribute more vague in the literal and figurative sense than that of atmosphere. In fact, etymologically speaking, atmosphere signifies a gas surrounding a body. So it's something very difficult to grasp somehow, atmosphere, because it's not, you cannot grasp it. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it belongs to the dimension of, of air. So etymology is something very abstract. In architecture, therefore, atmosphere begins where the building and its construction ends. It concerns that which emanates in the real sense of the term from the surface of a building its color, its light, its order, its sense, its temperature, or its humidity. It describes itself, therefore, in an architectural tradition defined by the art of illusion. It has to do with illusion, from the trompe l'oeil of the Baroque to the subconscious alphabet of Aldo Rossi, which you can see here, uh, expressed in his drawing, through to the atmosphere carefully collated in the image of the periphery and its second-rate architecture, a certain provincial modernism <coughs> by Swiss architects of that period. However, the terminological shift from the Italian ad ambiente to the German atmosphere is revealing. It translates a shift away from an interest in the environment in terms of the social and historical dimension toward the individual object in terms of its geographic context, which means where is it situated on the land or in the city, uh, and its materiality, which becomes so important also in the drawing. As trivial as this may seem, it was to be of importance to Swiss architecture, as it would make it possible to understand the built environment, not only in its historical dimension, but in a diachronic way, and hence to replace the abstract logic of typology in the reading of the city by a material logic such as it is inscribed and constructed in everyday life. It allowed the success of Aldo Rossi to steer the focus away from the great Italian tradition to the architecture of the Swiss periphery, away from an architecture language coded by architectural history to the language of the common habitus, of the common behavior of every day. In the process, the interest in embedding architecture in historical context was transferred to the object, to the process of its making, and to its effect. As you can see here in this drawing, you can somehow see the, mate the materiality of this building. You can also already <coughs> grasp the, how it is uh, constructed. This is, of course, not the case. For instance, the Aldo Rossi's a drawing which are very much abstract and where it's much more interesting somehow to show the historical precedents like the columns, the porticos, um, or the uh, simple uh, window of this building. This is the manner in which Miroslav Schick a student of Rossi, who together with Fabio Reinhardt founded the movement Analogical uh, Architecture, Analog Architecture, at the Swiss Institute of Technology in the late 1980s, and also Peter Zumthor understands the notion of atmosphere. For example, when Schick demands that his students represent the dirt of the roads in their chart perspective drawings, or to think about the heat of the asphalt in the sunshine, he encourages them not to limit themselves to the exigencies of the quotidian, but both to capture and most importantly to represent the atmosphere. So you have somehow to grasp also that the things which are not constructed, but uh, which are highly dependent of the construction 
and around it. What moves me the most, Peter Zumthor asked himself in his book Atmosphere, anything, he replies, anything, the things, the people, the air, the noises, the tone, the colors, material, presence, textures, forms to me. My mood, my <coughs> feelings, my expectations. So it's a very broad understanding of atmosphere, how it is defined here at the at the beginning, at the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s. And perhaps you know also the author uh, of this uh, drawing, for instance, Christian Kerr's student drawing, or Andrea de Platz's uh, drawing. Indeed, the title. Indeed, the title of Miley's essay, A Few Buildings, Many Plants, as I said, is symptomatic. It does, of course, describe the precarious condition of young architects with shorter commissions and obliged us to practice a profession through architectural competitions and through drawings. But above all, it puts the finger explicitly on the working technique, the architectural drawing, as opposed to the diagram or text, as we have seen at the beginning in the scheme of Lausanne, as a primary mode of reflection. So you see also in the evolution of the representation technique that in the 70s somehow the plan and the diagram was highly important. And then somehow in the late 80s, the beginning of the 90s, the drawing becomes one of the most important tool uh, of representation as it seems as a tool to best represent what I called before uh, atmosphere, as you can see, for instance, in this um, competition entry I've shown already uh, by Marcel Maire and Miroslav uh, Schick, where they try somehow to transpose and to visualize as an atmosphere transported by materials, texture, motifs, but also through the light or in the project of the proponents of the analog architecture at the ETH Zurich in the late 1980s, who in their meticulous analysis of the architecture of the periphery dissected out a vocabulary in order to reconstruct it into a new unity in the large chalk perspective. And the students of Miroslav Schick, I already showed one, and Christian Keres was one of the classes for another one course, Valerio Ajati was also one of the <coughs> a student in this studio. Pictorial intent, which is associated with the notion of atmosphere, manifests in the work of Schick, Meile, or later Zumthor, is accordingly more than a simple and detailed representation of a building on its side. It testifies also to a desire to use architecture to reconstruct a new coherent and distinctive ensemble, be it an urban or rural landscape, or even an interior one with its particular atmosphere, as I already uh, said. To understand architecture through its atmosphere is first and foremost to define it through its surfaces, and perspective drawings attest to that. What is realized in a radical manner in the academic context in the analogs, immense perspective drawings made at ETHF, ETH or in competition drawings, found its resonance in the same period in various projects realized by the young avant-garde. At the semantic level, uh, as we have seen in, in Miroslav Schick's uh, building here, where he used different formats of windows, very small and high windows to the street side, very large window on the courtyard. Um, or um, at, the, at the semantic <coughs> level, this translates into a reflection of the science of the periphery, aesthetic, legal, and cultural, among others, made manifest in certain motifs, such as the window, the chimney, or eaves, or even the villati uh, in the work of Marcus and so Kirchen at the uh, Odel House from 1984. Uh, at a technical level, it comes down to a quest for a grammar of construction, as manifest in projects by Christian Sumi and Marianne Burkhalter, namely the expression of different modes of constructions through joints, textures, and colors, 
or the use of planks, beams, and plywood as signifier of the building's different function. The entrance, which you have here, in this side, the living room here, which has a, a big uh, 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 plywood uh, plates, or uh, the roof, which has a uh, different construction. So they use different construction to give to the building, uh, to give uh, different significations to the building by the construction and the materiality uh, of um, the, the, the wood, as you can see here in this house from uh, the late in the middle of the 1980s. In the early work of Herzog and de Meuron, this shift translates into a new reading of the everyday conventions of the site manifest in its materials, motive, geometry, or even its colors, as in the blue house situated in an anonymous suburb with restrictive codes of construction. So somehow they had to use certain conventions, but they shift them uh, slightly by the shape of the roof or even by the window or the color um, they use, or of course in the Frey photographic studio near Basel, uh, a true collage of different motifs and materials such as skylights of a factory building or the inclined wooden roof of a garden <coughs> shed, which reflects the banality of the peripheral uh, zone. Or finally, on an urban scale, in the projects of Wiener and Wiener, one of the few firms to be given large projects since the 1980s. In the two housing blocks on the banks of the Rhine, Dina and Dina reinterpreted the modern grammar, horizontal windows, uh, structural grid and flat roof, and its formal potential to conceive the building as a reflection of the site's different image. The grid or the industrial along the little a river where there were uh, mills, um, the wooden uh, planks on the back side where there are some uh, wooden buildings, and on the front side toward uh, the square, somehow a, a simple and modern uh, language. A similar collage is present, interestingly enough, also at the level of the plants and its contract contradictory grammar, which exploits different modes of spatial and functional organization through typological uh, play. Enfilade and corridor, open space and individual rooms. So here you see in the, in the ground plan somehow the different potentials of uh, building. If you use pillar T or pillars, uh, somehow you can have a, a division completely independent and you can have an open space. And in the case here, a massive construction and your building becomes or has a completely different uh, language. <clears throat> Despite this different expression, there was a similarity in the methodology employed by the different architects. Jacques Herzog, when talking about his own work of the 1980s, aptly summarized this architecture approach as collage-like, and thereby underscored not only the formal and pictorial interest of his generation, but also through the asynchrony provoked by the collage of disparate motifs, its review of a historical logic. In fact, the fragmentation, a collage is a fragmentation of excellent elements is a fundamental prerequisite of any collage. This technique presents reality as a succession of isolated fragments, as in painting, or of successive sequences, as in film, so it's in space or in time, which are added together to create a temporal sequence or to articulate different narratives. So in a collage, somehow, you take different elements from reality, and the, the, the bringing together of this element becomes the real work of the artist, filmmaker or the architect. The significance of each image selected in isolation is subordinated to the principle of the assemblage. The import of any signifier is thereby transported from its content to its construction. 
This shift has rightly been described by other as a movement from a semantic grammar to a grammar of construction. So as a grammar of signification to a grammar of the way you construct things. So this is uh, highly visible here in this um, exhibition, uh, uh, a very early exhibition of Hertha de uh, in a building which, was, which is completely uh, glazed. And on the glazing of this building, they put a big a transparent uh, views of their whole project. And if you look carefully, you see uh, the, a building by Herzog de and behind it, you see uh, elements of the old city of uh, Basel. So there is this uh, uh, collage or superimposition of two different uh, realities. And they work uh, through the lens of the architect who brings these two realities together. The perspective of this of, of the, the building continues somehow the perspective uh, of the room, but also the perfect perspective of the little street, uh, which is in here. So they bring together a uh, 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 foreign reality and a reality of the uh, place. This grammar of construction manifests itself in an almost didactical way through an interest for the construction logic of building, as in Peter Zumthor's church at San Benedetsch in Zubich, where posts, beam, ceiling, and roof are singularized. So you can somehow read how the building has been uh, brought, how the elements have been brought uh, together. The beams are separated from the wall, uh, and they carry uh, themselves uh, the roof. Or, as in the facade, his museum in Bregenz, where the agraf, the metal elements holding the glass, the translucent glass, are exposed, explaining <coughs> almost didactically how things are held uh, together. Construction in these concepts primarily means building construction, which in Switzerland enjoys a long tradition. Its roots lie in the polytechnical or at least technical education that can be traced far back into the 19th century and found its institutionalization in the 1960s in the organization of architecture teaching at the ETH in Zurich, where the, the, core, the, core, the core of education is around design on the one side and construction on the other. The successful application of these disciplines up until the present was possible due to a highly to the high quality of local manual skills and handicraft. Nevertheless, the shift from a historical understanding of architecture to a constructional principle transcends, goes over as a purely technical uh, aspect. It is no coincidence that some 20 years after uh, the exhibition we have seen, during their 200 2002 show in Montreal, Herzog and Demo introduced the term natural history. That was the uh, original title of the exhibition. It was called Natural History. It was, it was then transformed by the uh, curator. And the term, the first term was uh, natural history, and the book which was published is called uh, Natural History. They introduced this term in the contemporary architectural debate, proposing a further shift in the autonomy uh, discussion. And this is the important shift. So we have a first shift from this diagrammatic, uh, which you have seen in the 70s, to this um, uh, formal understanding of architecture with Mario Botta, then a, a transportation somehow from the interest of the signification to the interest of the material. And here we have a third uh, shift uh, coming into the discussion. Of course, the exhibition did not consist of objects taken from a museum of natural history, but of various samples of their projects, models, materials, artifacts in various states of development, built in development or abundance. So you have somehow here not uh, new buildings, but you have materials, you have different samples, different models which are brought uh, together and which uh, represent different documents uh, with their own reality uh, of the design uh, process. 
These objects were intermingled with a series of other artifacts, fossils, tiles, toys, and also artworks, like a belt coat by Boyce, a sculpture by Donald Judd, which you can see uh, there, or even Alberto Giacometti. As in a museum of natural history, where different objects from different times and different contexts, but also in different conditions, collocate, at the CCA, the work of Herzog de Meuron was exhibited not in a linear process of becoming, from the sketch to the model, up to the building, but as a collection of materials in different states of aggregation or of disintegration. To think about architecture from this perspective is to challenge not only the dialectical relation, as did the analogues postulate of neither old nor new, but also this distinction between what is natural and what is artificial. So somehow we are a big broadening here uh, happening. It's not only a building and its context, but it's also uh, its built context, but it's also taking into account the material and later, as you will see, also the landscape as part of uh, reflection. This new relationship between architecture and its environment has been particularly evident in recent decades in the work of Herzog and Demeron, Peter Sumter, Valerio Algiatti, and other Swiss firms. In a number of projects, it is limited to analogy, to pure analogy, and a test to research into visual concerns. For instance, the relationship of the Ricola storage building, which I've seen already in the exhibition, in your form, <coughs> to the limestone query, where it is put into, you can see the limestone query, and you can see also that there are different layers visible here and here. You have to imagine a second a layer coming, as a wall coming uh, also <coughs> parallel to the building. So the relationship of the Ricola building in Dauphin to the limestone quarry in which it is located thus remains formal, even if the stratification of the building transforms <coughs> our perception of the site. Suddenly, we read this somehow as a street between two layers a facade or as a valley between two layers a stone. What is achieved through visual structure in Lofo find its geometrical echo in Valerius Pajati's school in Pasto, a deformed <coughs> parallelic bed, as you can see, uh, somehow the roof is not a straight, of course. The pitch roof of which traces the inclination of the side. As has been noted, to pursue the topography in this way, accentuates the object's abstract character and makes us overlook the obvious analogical association which is with its, with its essential traditional form of roof. So if you would cut here the building, so somehow so you would see that it's a building with a simple roof, but in this way somehow suddenly there is a, a game happening between the roof uh, and uh, the topography. At Lofon and Paspos, the relation to the environment is above all a formal one. By contrast, in Herzog and Demeron's small project in Tavole, in the north of Italy, the stone house, there the relationship between the building and the site acquires a conceptual dimension in the artistic sense of the term, first and foremost by refuting any distinction between old and new. I have to explain myself. The house is built of local ferruginous dry stone. So this is stone which has um, iron uh, in it, recycled from near, nearby ruins. So they take somehow existing or, or ruined uh, structures or stone from the structures to build uh, their house. In Tavole, therefore, ruins precede the edifice. So you have first ruins and then the edifice. Normally, it's an edifice which is destroyed and then you have the ruins. Here, it's opposite happening. Somehow, you take stones of an ex existing structures to construct a new uh, building. This interest in different moments in history to which the house attests has material correlation. For the dry, ferrous stone walls, 
are contained within a pre-pressed <coughs> concrete structure. Thus, one finds here a combination of two materials whose components are the same, but in different states of aggregation. So here, so you have uh, uh, cement, which is, uh, 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 or a concrete, which is done with stone and cement, and with, uh, of course, iron work inside, and here you have uh, stones which naturally con contain or have um, uh, iron in them. So here you have an interesting uh, way of combining two, ma two materials in a different state of aggregation, one highly artificial in the way it has been uh, proceeded to uh, be concrete, and the one um, uh, building up on existing uh, stones of the fields. Balearo Orjati's yellow house in flames likewise demonstrates the history of the building not through <coughs> academic reconstruction, but through a genuinely archaeological project. It not only reveals various successive phases of transformation, but unifies them also both at the structural level and given the coat of white paint applied uniformly to the stone substructure, the timber construction, the concrete window frames, and even the concrete belt on Attique on the top at the visual level. At the structural level, the concrete belt retains the four walls, so this concrete belt was necessary to keep the building which had been completely emptied from, from, from its structure. So without the concrete belt, somehow the walls would have fallen apart. So the concrete belt is necessary. At the structural level, the concrete belt retains the four walls of the hollow structure, and yet is simultaneously, simultaneously supported by them. So it's necessary, the, the, the attica is necessary for the building, but at the same time the building holds somehow uh, the attica. Here too, the historical logic of the building seeds to a material and constructive logic, and the relationship between cause and effect is erased accordingly, not only at the formal level, but also at the constructive, material, and even static levels. The morphogenesis, <coughs> the transformation of material hinted in at flames of Darbolem in an implicit or metaphorical way, finally becomes an integral part of the construction process, for instance, in terms of Demeron's uh, museum store in Basel, in the Vorterie and Aminia psychiatry clinic, or again in Peter Sumter's small uh, chapel, which I will uh, show, and at the territorial level in his baths in Wales. In Basel, the constructive approach perpetuates the conceptual approach pursued at Darbole, given that the gravel for the facade uh, was extracted from the excavation pit just around uh, the building. At Iverdon, uh, the strip facade attests to the layers of poor concrete applied successfully in varying shades of red and purple. At the little chapel, in Mechernich, Wachendorf, in Cologne, within the concrete structure of the relation, religious space, the internal formwork, the formwork which was necessary to build uh, the, the, the chapel, a tightly built around 120 slender tree trunks, is set alive and left to smolders <coughs> until all the each char shall remain, creating a potent place of worship to the unique pattern. So to build, um, he would put uh, trees in it, and you see still uh, somehow the volumetric of the trees, and then with a small fire, a uh, uh, very uh, uh, ongoing fire, it would burn somehow the inner facade, give, uh, give the, the patina uh, to uh, this uh, building. So here also there is a turn somehow that the formwork was holding the building, and at the end somehow give the shape to uh, the building. At Vals, finally, the, the thermal Vals, uh, the distinction between matter and material, between matter that participates in the domain of nature and materials that participate in the realm of the artificial becomes irrelevant. 
constructed from quartz stone, a stone characterized by its layered structure, the term bas advance can be understood in a general sense as a stratified reconstruction or construction of an artificial landscape, of the stone quarry, of the stone quarry which it has been uh, taken uh, from, or conversely, as Tomto has put it, as an edifice that creates the impression it has been existent far longer than its labors and is a natural part of the landscape. So here you see somehow that the stones which have been taken from the quarry are put together to give somehow a similar a reading uh, or a natural reading to, or natural atmosphere to the bass uh, uh, which is there. This development mirrors and indeed were currently evident in Swiss uh, architecture and Swiss design, namely to provide an adequate response to the increasingly complex relationship of architecture to its environment, of architecture to a very much transformed and, and um, artificial environment uh, of uh, our very small uh, country. Two possible alternatives can best describe this situation. On the one hand, one can propose a meta-science of nature that encompasses all complexity, all organic and inorganic processes as an energetic, overflowing and prolific whole, and on the other to conceive our environment as a human construction. So somehow you can understand the human as part of the nature. On the other side, you can conceive somehow nature as something completely artificial. The formal is reflected, for instance, in the work of Christophe uh, Giraud, whom uh, you may have met here uh, in his project from the Rhone Valley, where the river is considered as an actor with the same rights as the humans, which have been transforming it for the last 150 years, and where it is allowed upstream and downstream the settlement to overflow the field of high water. So somehow we can see here different sections throughout the valley. Here it's an urban zone where it is very much contained, but where it's <coughs> above and under as a city, somehow the river can flow over its banks and can somehow transform by itself uh, the landscape. The latter, so this would be somehow a representation of the first way of approaching nature, saying somehow everything belongs to the same, is part of it, and we ourselves belong somehow as natural subject to the nature. And the other way is to understand everything as constructed. The latter is to be found in the project of Master Maine, Marcus Peter, <coughs> or the Alp Valley in the Ettlingen, where the flow of the wind and the water are part of the architectural landscape that is designed. So here somehow everything is designed from the building to the uh, walk to the, to, the, to the fields and the layout and to the, the collection of the water which is collected on the roof and then brought back into the fields. So somehow here you have an understanding of our landscape which is completely uh, different, uh, artificial. And amongst the younger architects, um, as for instance in the work of the Genevan firm made in um, the relationship between topography, infrastructure and architecture is critically <coughs> assessed by the way that they are not considering that it's not anymore considered as opposites but it is critically assessed for the different potentialities for our environment the traditional plaza which is in the middle as well as the intellectual <coughs> field of the slope of the topography. So somehow here everything is taken into account. The railways which are here, the slope uh, of the topography which is taken as a perfect way of um, bringing two different parts through an escalator uh, together, but also a very traditional approach of a plaza, but also as we, we will see an iconography which takes into account other elements uh, like uh, battle, a uh, ship on the one side, or as you can see, 
the facade of um, the museum in Florence, as well as at Pearson Carrier, uh, the, the, the shops uh, by um, Sullivan and Arthur. So somehow they took the, the takes the different potentialities which history, but also uh, which the built environment gives to reassess, to rethink uh, architecture in their uh, work. Surprisingly enough, these latter studies actualize an old theme in Swiss architecture, albeit under different uh, under a different perspective. That since at least the end of the 18th century, continually tried to understand architecture and nature as part of the same landscape, as exemplified by the big theoretician of 19th century architecture, John Ruskin, Eugène Manuel, Eugène Manuel Viole de Duc, or uh, Bruno Tau, especially here in this fantastic uh, drawings of um, John Ruskin, who somehow tries to show the construction, really in the construction. He, he was an art critic. So uh, very interested in the topography and the geology, and somehow trying to show how a uh, shape becomes. And he will even uh, show the similarity between an, an, um, a fortification wall uh, and the abs as two ways, somehow, of constructing our environment. However, whereas until the first half of the 20th century, as in the construction of the Mont Blanc by Violet Le Duc, uh, here a very interesting uh, image too, so somehow Violet Le Duc would say uh, that originally, the origin of the Alps were pure shapes. And then, through rain and snow, it would slowly uh, disintegrate. And this is somehow the result we have. But from this result we have, uh, if you analyze it well, you can find geometrical rules which show that the origins uh, are to be, find, to be found uh, here. However, whereas until the first half of the 20th century, as in the reconstruction of the Mont Blanc, a, a big mountain in, in, in France by Viollet le Duc, or in the rebuilding of the Servin by Bruno Tau, mountains could be treated as objects to be remodeled. In the meantime, the natural landscape has long been subjected to total urbanization. So they could <coughs> dream somehow of an uh, architectural landscape. Somehow we have to deal uh, with this. This is the difference uh, between 18th, 19th uh, century and our contemporary situation. Accordingly, the aim today is not so much to reconstruct or to rebuild mountains, but to create an edifice that has a privileged relationship with the power of nature, the geological <coughs> substance, and the impressive topography, <coughs> as was Peter Zumthor's intention with the thermal bath in Wals, which we have seen before uh, the interiority. Jack Herzog found a similar formulation when faced with the topography of Tenerife, comparing his situation with that of Cézanne, Cézanne hopeless struggle with the Montagne saint victoire a, a mountain which Cézanne would, uh, would continuously try uh, to, to represent in his uh, paintings, um, uh, Jacques Herzog would see a similarity. The architect's goal, he says, must be to design something that reflects nature, but simultaneously remains autonomous. But this understanding of contemporary architecture as a successful reinterpretation of a natural history, and strangely by denying it as part of a cultural history, is only one side of the story, perhaps a better one. This is the better one I've told now. And after the conclusion, I will show that there is also a bad uh, aspect of this history. Indeed, the twofold references by Jacques Herzog to autonomy and painting is significant and reveals another, perhaps more crucial aspect. From this point of view, architecture is merely conceived as a pure problem of form, or to be even more critical, as a pure problem of surface. Numerous exhibitions, catalogues, symposia on Swiss architecture, promoted and sponsored by the federal state and Swiss companies, are an eloquent testimony to this. It is doubtless no coincidence 
that Swiss architecture has received such particular attention in this media-saturated market precisely to its refined visual quality. This development, however, is controversial. Architecture in this context is not anymore viewed for its intrinsic qualities, space or environment for man, but as a specific form of an economic added value which can be earned through a building or by hiring architects to design objects like battles and others. These battles are designed by architects with the goal, of course, to uh, position them as a brand on a larger market. In the process, the autonomous architectural objects claim to autonomy is slowly but surely being subverted precisely because of its autonomy as a marketable artwork. The boundaries between an architecture as an artwork and its economic absorption becoming erased. So somehow architecture and its shape is something you can sell silently. Indeed, as much as the idea of architecture as an autonomous discipline has been key to the architectural debate of the last 40 years, and gave birth to a powerful formal tradition in Switzerland, the growing importance of formal issues in the architectural discourse can also be viewed more prosaically as a steady loss of power of the architectural profession from the 1970s on. The point of discussion at the time, and which was intensively debated in the professional press in the 1970s, was the status of the architect as a critical subject in a transformed political and economic context. So it was discussed in the 70s how the architect could st uh, uh, still keep his position in face of the transformation of the profession. It was only against this background that the claim to an architecture as an autonomous discipline could even feasibly be formulated, because such a postulation can only be made by a discipline that believes it is in danger of losing precisely its status. So in, in, in discipline only <coughs> state that it wants to be autonomous when it's losing uh, this status. And that is, that I would argue, precisely what is happening since then. Thank you very much.